That's great. Thank you very much. I, I can't see any of you, but I, I, I got an earlier video stream from the back so I could see that there were eager people getting in their seats, hopefully with a nice fresh cup of coffee. So uh, I appreciate that. It's actually quite early for me. Uh, it's 548 a.m., but uh, I'm not tired because I just got back from Paris. So I'm still on European time. Uh, I was in Paris on uh, Monday and Tuesday for uh, OECD working party on AI governance meetings. And, um, uh, and that was very, very productive. And Estonia was in the room uh, along with many other nations. Uh, so uh, let me just take, before we go into the slides, let me just give you a little bit more about myself and, and my connection, not so much to this conference, but to Estonia. Uh, I've, had, um, I've had the privilege uh, of being uh, in Tallinn a few times uh, and going back, uh, I think 2018, uh, when I had the opportunity to uh, become uh, an advisor to uh, your government, uh, starting uh, my, my uh, client and now friend at the time uh, was Seem Sikut, you know, your former CIO and, and Ott Velsberg and, and others. And I had the opportunity to really get involved and play a role in, in the first development of your national AI strategy. And, and that was, uh, you know, that was a real privilege uh, at the time. I was at Ernst & Young at the time, uh, and uh, I've since, of course, moved to NVIDIA. Now here at NVIDIA, as your colleague was mentioning, um, I am the vice president and global head of a public sector, but I also serve in a few roles outside of NVIDIA as part of my sort of position in industry, as many of us try to do to give back. So I, I do sit on uh, the OECD, um, uh, I was mentioning the OECD, I'm the co-chair of AI Compute and Climate uh, Expert Group at the OECD. Uh, I'm also on the National AI Advisory Committee uh, in the U.S. and the chair of international cooperation for the Biden administration uh, in that respect. But I also have the privilege of sitting on the National AI Committee for Australia uh, as well. And so, you know, I have, a, I have a very good global view of what's going on, not just a view from the NVIDIA perspective, but just a view overall. And I try to bring that uh, to uh, to what I do, and I'll try to bring that here today for you. Um, okay, so so that's a little bit about me. Uh, let's uh, go to the next. Let's start start the deck, I guess. I see I'm on the screen. Um, here we go. Let's go to the next slide. I'm going to just spend a few minutes talking about Nvidia because, well, first, because I want you to understand why someone from Nvidia is talking to you at all. Some of you may know may may know Nvidia well. Most of you probably don't, or none of you know Nvidia as well as you should. So I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes on that. Uh, NVIDIA actually has some has some things in common with Estonia that I, that you probably don't know. First off, uh, like Estonia, NVIDIA is actually a, a small company. Uh, most people, you know, see the big market cap, uh, but but don't realize that NVIDIA has about 22,000 employees, which makes it the most valuable company in the world in terms of market cap uh, per employee. Uh, and compared to the other big tech firms, which are in the hundreds of thousands of employees, you know, NVIDIA is actually quite small. And so like Estonia, we're a small company, but we have big ambitions and, and look to make an impact that far uh, sort of outweighs our, our physical scale. Uh, and that's and we do like NVIDIA. We do that through ideas. We do that through our intellectual capital uh, by exporting sort of the impact of what we do and not just physical resources. And, uh, and, and again, like Estonia, I feel like we do that quite well. The other thing that we have in common is that if you look at the history of the company, uh, it's about a 35 year old company and we have a foundation in gaming and I'll go a little bit more into that in the next slide. But, but you know, we have this foundation in gaming and in visualization uh, and we built that foundation and it's world class and, and the entire future of the company grows on that foundation. And, and uh, we've leveraged that foundation to now become world class in artificial intelligence and other things. And again, like, you know, like Estonia has built this incredible foundation in digital leadership and digital government. Uh, and even more than that, a culture of innovation and a culture of, of taking sort of calculated, thoughtful risks on how to expand into new fields and to build on, on top of the foundation that you've done. And now moving into fields like artificial intelligence, you have that, that cornerstone of, of capability and culture. And NVIDIA is very similar. Uh, you know, we, we are we don't go out and just buy lots of companies. We build on the foundations that we've created. So we have this heritage of, of creating these synthetic worlds in which millions of gamers get lost. And that's great. And we will continue to do so. And it continues to be a robust part of our business. But over the past three decades, NVIDIA has built on that foundation to become the leaders in scientific computing and professional visualization and animation and movies. In fact, one, one of the 
one of the things we're most proud of, it's a, it's a, it's a minor unrelated anecdote for today, but I'll just say it because it's, it's interesting, is that uh, for the last 14 years, so what is it? So essentially since 2008, uh, it has not been possible to win an Academy Award or even get nominated for an Academy Award. So 100% of all nominees and winners for the past 14 years in the areas of special effects uh, have all been uh, have all been artists working on NVIDIA's platform. Uh, and that's because you know we, we, we have built up this foundation of professional visualization and graphics technology that is unmatched, right? But again, taking that stack, that specialized stack of hardware and software and, and expanding its value and its use cases for scientific computing, artificial intelligence, autonomous machines, and then most recently the metaverse, all of which are just building on that foundation. And so we're very proud of that and it's a unique company in that way. Let's go to the next slide, please. So the the uh, uh, the, the purpose of this visual is, again, just to kind of make a point that when you talk about foundations, you talk about layers of value on top of that to really understand NVIDIA and to understand why I'm speaking at this conference and why we're able to have this impact across the world in so many parts of the economy. You have to realize that we're still a chip company at the bottom layer. You see CPU, GPU, DPU. DPU stands for data processing unit, which goes into the network technology. So we have the, the chips that people think of us as a chip maker. But that's again, that's one layer of our stack. You know, we, we have the, the hardware, the full computing systems, the libraries, the platforms, and then ultimately different industry and, and other uh, reference architectures at the very top for healthcare and language and recommender systems and energy systems and, and, and auto. And, and so again, this entire stack from chips to platforms, this is what's unique about NVIDIA. This is why our market cap is so high, and this is why our impact will continue to grow across the world, because while we do have thousands of engineers that work on chips, we have many more engineers working on software and domain-specific solutions, and so our company uh, is really quite unique uh, in the way it's, it's bringing this, this computing platform uh, to the marketplace. All right, so let's, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so, you know, you have plenty to, to there are plenty of experts in, in, in the room today on, la on language and language models, and I am not going to spend any more time on it than this one slide, because I, I think you'll have plenty, you've had plenty to talk about today on this topic. I, I'm going to focus on other things. So, you know, th this, uh, this is just uh, to make the point, of course, within large language models, NVIDIA has played a large role and continues to play a large role. Uh, you know, some of the largest, if not the largest language models in the world have all been trained on NVIDIA's platform. If they were not, if NVIDIA was not around, then uh, maybe your great, great, great grandchildren uh, may have had the benefit of these technologies. Because some of these platforms, which may still take weeks to train, would take a thousand years on, on uh, CPUs. So it is only through the innovation of the parallelism, parallelism that's, a, that's a hard word to say at five in the morning, uh, and, and the unique architecture of, of this, the GPU accelerated computing platforms, and of course, you know, the advances in data science and deep neural networks and, and, and all the different training techniques, you know, all of it combined on the software, the hardware, uh, makes it possible to train, you know, multi-hundred billion and trillion parameter models uh, in, in days to weeks, which, again, is an astounding feat uh, if you were to compare that on existing or prior generation computing platforms, we're talking about decades or centuries uh, to accomplish the same goal. So you literally are able to do your life's work now, uh, you know, in far short of your lifetime, which is something that has increased, you know, the potential for innovation and improvement in these technologies. And that's something we're quite proud of. And so, but that's, that's of course, one aspect of this technology. And, and we're not going to spend any more time on it because I'd like to give you a broader view and think about this infrastructure and this technology uh, uh, in just in a different way. And, and then you can come back to language, you know, if you'd like. So let, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too much time lecturing you on artificial intelligence, but I, I, I want you to just, and this is really my personal view, I just want you to have a sense of how I think about it. Uh, just as a sort of a setup to the rest of the meetings. Please go to the next slide. So, first off, you know, there's a million definitions of AI, and 
it's fine to have more than one definition. There are different ways to talk about it because there's different reasons to use it. There's different contexts in which AI is relevant. And if you're in a room like I was on Monday with a room full of policymakers that have limited to no technical background versus you know, a different kind of room, which is filled with engineers uh, you know, and, or, or perhaps industry executives, you know, you're gonna talk about artificial intelligence in a different way. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. There's, there's just different reasons to define it differently. Personally, I think about AI as the ability to emulate or, stim or simulate human-like cognitive function. I like that definition. It's a functional definition. So it's not so much about how it works, but more about what it does. Uh, and, and what it does is a practical reason. So not what it does in terms of the weights and biases inside of a neural network. And so it's not about the, the inner workings of AI, which I think is less useful in most conversations, but it's more about why does it matter? And it matters because you, you have the ability to simulate a human-like cognitive function. And if you can simulate a human-like cognitive function, you can do two things. You can improve that simulation, right? And you can scale that simulation. And there's big implications. There's both commercial, sociological, scientific, and of course, geopolitical implications for that. The first, one, the first thing I mentioned was improve, right? So you can simulate a human-like cognitive function, but you may not be able to simulate it very well initially, right? But then over time, you improve that simulation. Now, I use the word simulation very importantly because it's not human intelligence, it's artificial intelligence. So you're simulating human intelligence, right? But you can, if you can improve that simulation through a variety of techniques, then at some point that simulation may even exceed human capacity. And of course, that's the case now in many areas, right? Such as computer vision, where models are able to detect and decipher and, and interpret images, even when they're obscured, even with when, when they're upside down, even when you can only see a third of it or so forth, and they can, or, or face, you know, and they can do that. They could recognize and make observations about the attributes of that image more accurately than humans. You know, an example would be in, in the medical field, uh, in the last few years, the 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 ability for uh, AI to diagnose radiopa uh, uh, radionopic, uh, retinopathy, sorry, diabetic retinopathy, uh, as you know, in the eye, uh, exceeds human doctors. Right? The FDA has acknowledged this: that a doctor looks at an image, they will be accurate, but less accurate than if an AI looks at an image in diagnosing diabetic retinopathy. So in some cases, in some narrow examples, I say narrow because it's the case, some narrow examples, humans are not as good as AI. In, other, in many, many, in most cases today, that's not the case. But, but again, you're able to, to improve it. If you can improve something then you can, and it's digital, then you can scale it. And of course, this is the other big implication. By scaling means you can have a thousand, a million, a billion human-like AIs at your disposal, right? Now, how might that be useful? Well, again, you know, if, if access to medical care is a problem in certain parts of the world, in all parts of the world, not just not just uh, emerging nations, even in, in wealthy nations, there are rural areas where access to medical specialists is a problem. So if you can scale a superhuman AI that can diagnose an important disease, eye disease, and you can make that available to everyone in a rural area or a low resource area where they don't typically have access to those kinds of medical specialists, well, then you can solve a really important problem. Instead of having to recruit medical specialists and ship them and transport them and house them down to those areas, you can capture an image of an eye and you can apply that through it. And it'd be like having a billion ophthalmologists at your fingertips. Right? Uh, without any, with, with you know, rub an incremental cost of zero. So again, if you think of it again using this simple definition, and you see the opportunity to improve and scale, then you can that opens your mind to how you might apply that to many other things, including language. Right? If you have a a conversational agent that can speak a language that that very few people can speak, or can speak a language uh, and and make that available to those all around the world where they don't typically have access to native speakers in that language, then you can create a level of accessibility and connectivity that wasn't possible before. You can also preserve a language, right? Language preservation and other things. So, uh, you know, there's just, you can follow that. I don't need to hit that anymore, but you, you get the point, right? All right, let's go to the next slide. So 
uh, from a journey, th this is another very general slide, but I, I, I feel that not everyone fully gets this. You know, artificial, one of the questions I get all the time, and I get this question from prime ministers, you know, at the highest levels of government, well, why, why, why is AI so important? Isn't it just another technology? The answer is no, it's not just another technology. First off, it's not a technology, it's a constellation of, of technologies and domains, right? Uh, so it's not a singular technology, but, you know, since the dawn of time, there have only been 27 or 26 general purpose technologies, right? Since the domestication of plants thousands of years ago. So if you if you look at you know if you look at the history of of, of sort of innovation and technology going back to you know very early days, uh, this is only the 27th time in history in recorded history that we have a general purpose technology that can transform society at this scale. There's not that many examples, in fact. And so in each time that we have a general purpose technology, it requires a, a response at this level, right? And, and I think that the world has a whip to that, but this, you know, there's a very clear documented reason why AI is important that we need to react and respond both to the opportunities and the risks, you know, to the issues and the challenges around AI. And I think that, you know, that we're doing that as a world, but this is why. It's it's not uh, it's not uh, it's not unclear as to why the world needs to take it very seriously and why there's so much potential opportunity. OK, next slide, please. Now, you know, since 2000, AI, we can argue all, you know, what, what historians can argue is when artificial intelligence came about and you can go all the way back to Ada Lovelace and Alan Turing and and, you know, all, all the different individuals over the last hundred years that contributed to the field. So that's not important for the, for, for the purposes of today. What's important is that what, what's, what's not controversial and what everyone will agree on is that before 2016, there was no global imperative. There just wasn't. So 2016 was really the turning point, uh, you know, and a number of things happened that year, but, but, you know, it was during that year that essentially AI went from being uh, an academic discipline with a, some, some limited sort of enterprise business traction, uh, you know, here and there, uh, but, but it became a global policy imperative where heads of state across the world realized this is something we need to take seriously. This is something we need to build capability and capacity as a national government. This is something that we need to have a plan for, right? And you can see in the middle graphic, starting with Canada, you know, there was a, a parade of, of nations, of course, that have developed and deployed, not only at this point, because we're five, six years into this journey, uh, you know, nearly every country, certainly not every country, but nearly every country has released a national AI strategy. Several are already on their second or even third version of that strategy, uh, and everyone is to some degree implementing that strategy, right? And and it, and having uh, been involved in writing multiple strategies for nations, having read every one that has published one, and and being involved as I am across the world, uh, I can say conclusively that no one is doing exactly the same thing. No country is in the same position. There is no one single answer. Uh, it, there are templates and there are commonalities across many of these plans for sure. Uh, but 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 you know everyone has their own pace. And I, I was uh, when I was in the OECD yesterday, I was talking to uh, uh, a representative from Slovakia and and also uh, Romania, and they were explaining how they're in the process of pulling their plan together and, you know, they're a little behind as, as they said. And, and I, and I push back. I said, well, you're not really behind. I think there's advantages to being where you are, which is you get to learn from the countries that has started early, uh, who, who not sure they made any mistakes, but, but they, you know, they've learned what was worked and what hasn't worked. And that knowledge is now available to be used and you can build on that. Right. And quite frankly, it's more important to get it right than to do it quickly. Uh, and so every country is just working at their own pace. Uh, but, but this is, this is this is not a trend. It's not a fad. This is the new normal. Uh, there, there, you certainly will not. It will be very challenging to be a developed and successful, robust economy, uh, and not have a uh, sophisticated and comprehensive plan for the role of artificial intelligence in your economy. Uh, and that's and that is that is the case today. Okay, let's go to the next slide. The first. The first, I think the first place that, well, the two places when AI really made the biggest impact, one is not on the slide, which is really e-commerce and, 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 and so forth. I mean, you know, you, you saw very early examples of obviously artificial intelligence uh, really helped shape the early, you know, some of the early, all the early businesses on, on the web. Uh, 
uh, that have really gained traction, uh, you know, have leveraged machine learning uh, to some degree. And so there's that. But putting that aside, I think, you know, the really the first real game changer for the world has been the role of AI in science and, and the use of both supercomputers as 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 the workhorses and then AI as a workload on top of that. Uh, to advance you know, almost every field of science, quite frankly. And we're at the point now where it's very difficult to win, nearly impossible to win a Nobel Prize uh, in, in, in these areas, these frontier areas like physics and chemistry and biology, if you're not working on a large supercomputer and leveraging uh, artificial intelligence. This is just, to put it differently, you know, science has become very computational. End to end, science has become a field, you know, a field of computation. And if you're not leveraging computation and, and all the tools that go with it, then it's difficult to be pushing the outer barriers of those fields. And so you see, you see uh, not just leaps, but million X leaps uh, in science, you know, the, the ability to do things a, a million times bigger, models that are a million times bigger, train models that are a million times faster uh, than you saw just a few years ago. So, so science is progressing. Our understanding and our insights is progressing in part uh, because of these technologies. You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of excitement and a lot of energy focused on the James Webb telescope and, and, and these incredible images that are coming down. Uh, so part of that innovation, part of that, you know, obviously the science there was the, the incredible mechanics and physics and experience of the of all the engineers who put that satellite and that and that incredible telescope. Up in space. Uh, but the other half, lesser known part of it is the innovation of the supercomputers and the AI models on the ground uh, that are powered by NVIDIA that are interpreting those images. Right. The images coming back down from James Webb are unbelievably dense uh, and, and also need upscaling, uh, frankly, uh, depending on the image. And, and the only reason we're able to get those images, capture them, uh, and then interpret them, and then share them with the public is because the, the engineers on the ground have access to these incredible tools of technology uh, that combine with the telescope itself. And so if we didn't have all of that together, we wouldn't be enjoying these images. So the, the leaps in science is really unbelievable. And, and we will see advances in our lifetime uh, that, that should take five or 10 lifetimes to see. And that's something that's really quite exciting. Okay, let's go to, but we're gonna focus now on economics. So let's go to the next slide. And then, okay, and let's go to the next one after that. So we're going to talk about economics because that's that's a little more, I think, interesting for our purposes today. So, you know, economics, you pick your favorite consulting firm, PwC, Accenture, McKinsey, Deloitte. Everyone has published a study on this. And so I just grabbed one to to give an example. Uh, there there is no doubt that there's some big number in the trillions, whatever it is. There's some big number in the trillions of economic value that will be unlocked, that is being unlocked, and will continue to be unlocked relative to the use and the deployment of AI, the adoption of AI across every sector of the global economy. That value, the AI value, is coming in two forms, right? Productivity gains is one side of it, right? making workers more productive and, and so forth, uh, even professors more productive you know, in the labs. And, and, and then there's new generations of products and services, right? Things we didn't have before that we have now. And, and so AI is impacting, you know, industry in that way, creating these trillions and trillions of, of dollars. Of course, that value is not being captured evenly, right? There's no, there's no rule or there's no law, natural law that says that that value, the AI value is going to be evenly distributed across the world. Clearly, uh, it's going to be captured uh, in nations that either adopt AI and leverage it in their workforces and are able to imp implement AI at scale at a micro level across small and medium-sized businesses and large-scale businesses and the government itself to achieve those productivity gains and also where the innovation thrives. And this is one area that this is, of course, one, this is something about Estonia that's so unique and cool is that, you know, for being a small country, it has created this culture of innovation that has led to the development of so many exciting companies and, and unicorns and so forth. And, and, and so the, the products, the products and services, right, that are coming out of, will enable it as a country to capture revenue and, and, and market share that, that certainly out, uh, uh, out, out competes its, its physical scale, which is, you know, one of the unique aspects, I think, of AI. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So that's one way to look at it. Okay, let, let, let's go, but let's go to, uh, let, let me make a bigger statement. I'm going to start with energy. I'm only using energy for a moment to, to sort of open your mind and then 
going to go back to AI for a second. So this should be a relatively easy slide to understand, right? You you have this idea of domestic energy production, and 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 that's. I think we all just intuitively, whether you're an energy expert or not, we all sort of intuitively understand what that means, right? And you've got sort of the human component and the infrastructure component, right? You've got policy, energy policy, and that sets the stage for success or not. You've got the talent and, and the entire value chain, the ecosystem of companies that, that, that do different things in that within that sort of energy sector, uh, right? Uh, and then you've and then you've got the hard infrastructure. You've got the wells or the refineries or the grids or whatever it is, right? You know, you've got the the sort of the hard infrastructure that supports that ecosystem, and that and all of that together, you know, leads to some form of energy independence or not, right? Uh, or it relates to uh, you know an energy dependence on on foreign sources of energy. And I think everyone basically, like, this is a very, very oversimplified crude framework, but I just, but I think it's relatively easy to understand, right? Okay, now let's go to the next slide, the next version of this framework. I'm going to swap out energy and I'm going to put in AI, right? Because this is not something and it's not the way people have thought about it before. So do countries have domestic AI production capability? Well, let's run it through like, you know, like we did with energy. You've got AI policy. Again, many countries are progressing uh, in that respect. And, and, and certainly in Europe, uh, which is leading the world in many, in many areas related to AI policy. Then you've got AI talent in the ecosystems around that. And, and that definitely plays out on a country by country basis. Some countries uh, are producing more AI talent than others. Pretty much every country has a shortage of AI talent. I don't know of any country that would claim that they're, they have more people than they need. Uh, and then within the ecosystems, you've got startups, which are very important, but you also have the large established industries that are trying to you know, back into AI and you know, transform themselves and so forth. And you have governments as well within that mix. And then you have the infrastructure, right? The, the infrastructure to support that industry. And we'll call these the AI factories, right? This is the data centers and the computers and the clouds that, you know, without which you can't manufacture AI. You know, it, most people don't think of AI as a product to be made. AI is software ultimately, right? But you have to manufacture, you have to produce AI. You produce the AI through a training process, right? But that training requires the talent, it requires the data, and it requires the infrastructure. And in this, and you put that all together, and you have, like with energy, AI independence, right? Or you don't. <laughs> you know, that, that's the question, right? To what extent does your nation have a form of AI independence? And to what extent is your country dependent on foreign sources of artificial intelligence or foreign sources of talent, foreign sources of data, or foreign sources of infrastructure? You know, these are all just ways to think about it that maybe are a little bit new relative to how you thought about AI in the past. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So now I, I've given that framework, and so so if you if you just sort of just ex for the purposes of this meeting, just agree with me, and let's just put it aside for a moment. We're going to come back to it uh, as far as the implication of that. Now I want to give you an example. I could spend the next five slides talking about language models, but again, you've had that all day. So I'm going to give you a different a different a different workload, a different way to think about the importance of AI and that infrastructure and all that talent. You know, why does this matter, right? And let's let's talk about the metaverse because it comes up a lot today, right? Now, th there's there's a lot of terms here. There's the metaverse, there's multiverse, there's simulations, there's digital twins. You know, th these are all related terms, uh, and I'm going to ex I'll explain them a little bit as we go in. So please go to the next slide. So. Look, the, the metaverse is more popularly known as sort of a consumer paradigm and, and uh, you know, and, and sort of a massively parallel immersive environment in which people can get lost and, 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 you know, sort of exist or coexist in the physical world, but having their digital avatar. And in that world is, is a very uh, consumer like experience for uh, socializing and shopping and maybe watching m movies or music and so forth. And that's all great. And that and that is one version of the metaverse. And, and I think initially people uh, just assumed that there would be this one sort of large dominant metaverse in which people would all sort of convene and, and transact. And that's really not the way it's playing out. You know, what's really playing out is more of a multiverse where you have you will have millions upon millions of these individual metaverses, some of whom will connect. Uh, and so you will be able to jump from one to the other. 
Uh, but the majority of these metaverses in the multiverse will be individual. They will either be, uh, you know, industrial metaverses uh, for industrial purposes, and I'll give some examples in a second. Uh, they will be confidential or classified metaverses. There, there will be within your company. You know, there might be corporate metaverses where you will get together with, for with your fellow employees, like you like you do now on an internet. Uh, you know, there's there will just be literally an infinite number, millions and millions of these virtual worlds that will be created and that will coexist for different reasons, and they'll have different functionalities and different purposes. Now, in this consumer visual, right? Things like physics don't really matter. You know, they matter a little bit. You you might, you know, if you drop something, you, you probably will expect it to fall down to the ground versus floating up to the sky. So there, there'll be some respect for the natural laws, but but it, it's it's still kind of a game, right? It, it's it's a gaming type environment. You know, having having physics accuracy is not so important as having sort of, sort of some approximate proximity to the natural laws, right? Uh, when light hits your face, you'll you, you kind of assume there'll be a shadow behind you. So again, it'll be approximation of, of the laws of, of nature, but being accurate is not super important in this environment. In an industrial metaverse, where you're trying to create a digital twin, right? And I'll give some examples in a second. In an industrial metaverse, well, that's very different. In an industrial metaverse, you're going to want accuracy. You're going to want extreme accuracy so that you can actually simulate the laws of nature and you can leverage that, you know, to create value. And in that context, you need a level of expertise and infrastructure that looks a lot more like the large language models that you're looking at. So go to the next slide. And when you can do that, when you can simulate the laws of nature, you can do something else that's quite interesting. You can essentially travel through time. So cl click on the next slide. Let's do a click through here. Now imagine, oh, please click on the slide. Thank you. Imagine that if you're trying to train a robot to do a certain task, but in the real world, to train that robot to do that physical task, like pick up a rubber ball, it would take you 42 years to do that. If you had to train them on every possible scenario and what that rubber ball could look like, could feel like every time they'd squeeze that ball, you know, to train a machine to do that in a real, you know, in a real world might take decades to do that. Click again, please. But if you do that in a simulation, if you can go inside of a, of a virtual world in which you can create all of those scenarios and you can replicate them a million times, you can run them in parallel, right? Then you can train that machine in one day. So in effect, you can accelerate the time to achieve your goals, to train machines to be machines, to train robots to be robots, to achieve certain industrial tasks. You can do them in a metaverse, in a simulated world, uh, far faster, more efficiently and safer. Click out one more time, please. And, and the level of performance enhancement in this case, in this one example, and this is a real example, by the way, uh, you know, the, is 1.5 million times faster. Now, if you can do something 1.5 million times faster in a simulation, then, you know, you can imagine how that might be beneficial through many different contexts. So let's go to the next slide. So in Europe, some very large industrial companies like BMW, Daimler, and Siemens are using this kind of technology, industrial digital twin technology, to recreate their factories. And they're recreating not just in terms of how they look, but in terms of how they operate, how they feel as, a, as a, to work inside them. And every little bolt, every little part, everything in that factory has been simulated down to the minutest detail, including the materials of that item. And all the laws of physics are not just simulated, but they are accurate inside this simulation because you have underneath it the software and the hardware to replicate this in, at scale. And this has never been possible before. And so these kind now, if you can do this for a factory, what else can you do it for? Go to the next slide, please. You can do it for the world. If you can, if you can model a factory or a building, then you can model a city. If you can model a city, why not a country? And if you can do a country, why why not the whole planet? And that's essentially where we are. Projects like Destination Earth in Europe and Earth Two at Nvidia and others are reaching the point of having again both the data science and the hardware and they together to simulate not just one part of, of our ecosystem, but the entire planet at scale, all the biophysics of our atmospheres and our oceans and our land masses, as well as the human behavior, right? Planes and cars and other kinds of activities all interplaying at scale in real time. And when you can do that, now you have the ability essentially to predict the future. And this is where, you know, this is where we're headed today. Next slide, please. 
So simulation has now become an economic superpower. Just like the, the, the ability to, to build large language models, the ability to simulate the, the you know the creative virtual world that simulates the natural world will give nations and companies this ability to essentially travel through time. Right. And 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 this is not an easy thing to do. I'm not suggesting this is an off the shelf, off the truck, plug in an application like PowerPoint, you're just ready to go. These are very complex tools, very complex machines. They require a lot of science, some science that hasn't even been invented yet. So we're on a journey to doing this well. But have no mistake, this is happening, and it's happening in every sector of the economy. We we have pharmaceutical companies that are simulating and you know bio, biological systems for the discovery of the next generation of medicines. You know companies again like Siemens and, and Daimler and BMW that are simulating uh, their entire fact all of their factories that now coexist with their physical factories uh, in, in order to completely transform the operational paradigm of manufacturing. Uh, you have countries that are simulating their cities or their nations are moving towards that to support policymaking, urban planning, infrastructure, you know, all those kinds of decisions. And I'll just go down the line. This is this is definitely happening across the world. Everyone is in the early stages of the journey. No one has completed it, but it's happening. And I think it's very important just to be aware of that. OK, next slide, please. OK, so go to the next slide. So. Now I've given you sort of a picture of all these incredible things that are happening. I just want to kind of, in the next, in, in this final section or so of the, of the deck, tie it back to sort of policy a little bit, uh, which is, again, this technology, the supercomputers, the artificial intelligence, all together, these have been instruments of scientific discovery for, for a few decades now. And so, you know, we're really starting to see the benefits of that, and it's accelerating. But what the new chapter that's really quite interesting that builds on the first chapter is that now these are not just instruments of science. They're now engines of economic growth. And, and this is this is important because this is why having them matters. <laughs> this is why the technology matters. It's not just because it's cool. It's because what it's doing and the implications of not having it. And because if you don't have it, that means you don't have access to what it produces or you have to buy from someone else, which is fine, but it, you do have to think of the implications of that. So let's go to the next slide. As a result, in the last few years, what I focus heavily on in my work uh, at NVIDIA and across the world in my policy roles is this idea of a compute divide. And, and I've been trying to sound the alarm to this, and, and, and it's been successful. And so there's now a lot of focus on it. I'm quite proud of that, which is the fact that, that only 31 countries in the world have this infrastructure within their borders. And, and, and this is important because up until recently, that was only important for science. And for the most part, that science was shared. Then that science, you know, frankly, became more of a, a public good for the world in many cases. But, but, uh, and I think looking at the vaccines, you know, it's a good example of that. You know, the COVID crisis. But now that these machines are also, and this infrastructure and this talent is now combined, is now the engines for economic growth. It matters even more because it, it will now play an even bigger role in both the the capturing of the value right from that early part of the deck, the the trillions. But it also plays a role in the growing uh, inequities between the haves and the have-nots. And the fact, and the simple fact is, well, maybe it's not simple, but it's still a fact. 80% of the country in the world do not have supercomputers large enough within their countries to compute models at scale that enable them to, to be leaders in the production of this capacity without using a foreign source of infrastructure or talent outside of their country. That's just a fact. In, in some cases, they're able to work around that, and they're able to harness it in an effective way. And in other cases, they're not. But this is this is uh, this is one of the contributions to the growing inequities, certainly within the global South, uh, in in, in sub-Saharan Africa, where there are no supercomputers and there's obviously a shortage of talent. Uh, and and this is this is a problem for, for those countries. Okay, next slide, please. The world has been opening up to this. Uh, I've been talking about it, writing about it for about two years now, uh, and it's starting to it's starting to gain traction. And, and there's a you know there are some articles and, and sort of things out there. But the, this idea of the compute divide and the compute divide is sort of, of a sub division under the di the bigger digital divide, right? Which is much more broadly about access to the internet uh, and, and the digital economy. Uh, the compute divide is a little more specific, but it has but the implication is 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 just as profound. Next slide, please. And again, at the OECD, uh, thankfully, we, we have a task force now, uh, the AI Compute Task Force, and I'm one of the co-chairs. Uh, and, and this task force has spent the last 18 months looking at this question and, and helping uh, bring together 50 or 60 
opportunity to the world on this topic to develop some answers and some guidance for nations on how they can close the compute divide. Very proud to say that next week at COP27, uh, we'll be rolling out the first of two reports uh, to, to uh, speaks on this issue. Actually, next week we'll be rolling out the environmental impact of AI report. Uh, I'll be doing that on the 15th. Uh, I'll be virtually uh, participating in the OECD pavilion in, uh, in Egypt. And, and that report will talk about and share sort of the latest findings on how nations need to think about the sustainability of AI. Uh, and and both, again, both the science and the hardware uh, and the importance of, of factoring that into your overall strategy and approach, both publicly and, and commercially. Uh, and then uh, hopefully within two months, we'll release the, the main report, which will be really on AI compute itself and, and how nations can think about and plan out their national compute strategy to coincide and support their national AI strategy. Next slide, please. Now, just to bring it back home, since we are, this this is the week of COP27, and I, I thought it'd be good to just focus on this topic because it, it's, uh, I think, next to large language models, uh, you know, one of the, we talked about simulation, but I want to now make it a little bit more real, uh, you know, as far as its potential value here, is this idea of planetary scale resilience, right? How, how do we improve the resilience of the planet? Uh, and, and ultimately, you'll bring that down to a nation scale resilience conversation. Well, there's no one answer. There's no one answer to that. And there's no silver bullet. And AI is not the silver bullet. But but there's a role to play. And when you take all these technologies, you take supercomputing, you take AI, you take simulations, you take digital twins, you take all these technologies and you put them together. It actually does play an important role. So let, let's go to the next slide, please. Now, this is a very scary. The next two slides are a little scary. You, you may or may not have seen this visual. But you know, back in 2000, uh, or you know, some years ago, scientists got together and they developed this way of looking at the different planetary boundaries uh, within the different aspects of our world, uh, and and projecting out where we were and and where we should stay if we want to preserve the balance of our ecosystems. And, and again, this was uh, you know 2009. If you jump to the next slide, unfortunately, you know, uh, or not, you know, over the course of that time since then, uh, as we've reassessed our situation, as you can see, we've pushed you know, beyond those boundaries, uh, sadly, in, in a number of key areas, such as fresh water and, and pollutants and so forth. And, and and this is part of the reason we're in such an environmental crisis and why the, the COP27 is so important. So, so I don't think there's any doubt about that. Going to the next slide. So what are the implications of exceeding these planetary boundaries? Well, one of the main implications is, is this idea of extreme weather events right? These, inc these incredibly devastating floods. Floods are, by the way, the number one most devastating extreme weather event in the world. Uh, after floods, you have fires and, and, and others. But, but you know, you have these extreme weather events and, and they're getting more frequent and they're getting bigger, right? And more dangerous and more deadly. And, and, you know, you can look at the news and you can see that to be the case. But I can tell you as a matter of statistics, the expectation is they were double or triple the number of extreme weather events, you know, in, in the next few years. That is a that's a very scary fact. I personally live on the edge of a forest in Southern California. I have a 400,000 acre forest behind my home, which was a real sales point. When I moved there eight years ago. Now that is, you know, a very scary reality because that is a tinderbox waiting to explode. Uh, and, uh, you know, so these, these issues are very real to me as they are to many of us. So if you go to the next slide, one of the, one of the main challenges with extreme weather events, so we can't prevent them, necessarily. But one of the main challenges is trying to predict them and trying to forecast them and ultimately, you know, plan and respond to them. Click on it, please. Now, the, currently, the vast majority of weather models in the world are numerical. They are not AI. They are raw, brute mathematics. And they're accurate only up to six days. So when it comes to predicting weather and then using that, extending that to extreme weather, frankly, current weather models are not very good. And this is one of the challenges. Click again, please. The, the next generation of models will be, will be powered by artificial intelligence and supercomputers, not just brute mathematics. But there's a big cultural change. This requires a lot of scientists and a lot of code, and a lot of people have built their entire careers around these numerical models to change. And that's happening very slowly, unfortunately. Uh, these new models can predict weather out up to six weeks, right? six days to six weeks and i think you can i think we can all agree whether you're a scientist or not that that's a big deal right click click uh please so nvidia re nvidia's team recently developed a model called forecast net forecast net is a completely uh, ai driven model for for weather prediction it is extremely powerful click, click again please this model 
is able to predict the weather. Oh, can you please click on the slide? Thank you. This weather can, pre can predict the model 45,000 times faster than a numerical model and using 12,000 times less energy. So I think you would all agree that's a win, right? You know, and that we want to use this technology, that this is not incremental change, right? Remember my earlier slide when I talked about million X leaps? You know, I, I, you know, again, I wasn't just throwing that out there. Here's an example. This is what a million X leap looks like. Right. You can predict weather six weeks in advance, not six days. You can do it 45,000 times faster and use 12,000 times less energy. That's what the future needs to look like. But that requires cultural, operational and scientific change. Right. This is not just about deploying a technology. It's about scientists and policymakers embracing that technology and understanding its role. And then ultimately, you know, bring that into the larger disaster management culture and the end to end workflow of weather and disaster response. And this takes time. These things don't happen overnight. But it's not a matter of whether we have the technology. I'm going to tell you we have it. It exists today. It's being used. It's on GitHub. This model exists in the open source. It's been contributed to the world. But using it is another is another issue entirely. Next slide, please. So to bring it all together, if you can click on this a couple, I think there's four clicks here. Uh, so again, going back, I showed you the slide earlier, right? The simulation. So here's how simulation becomes a huge impact, right? If you can take this technology, you take the, the behavior of natural disasters and you combine this ability to simulate light, matter, physics, and, and, and you know the ability to simulate the natural world, and you run that on top of large scale computing, you get a virtual world, a metaverse that simulates the real world. This is the ability to anticipate and respond and recover from natural disasters and extreme weather events. And click on the last one here. And, and this this is the, you know, this is a, this is an important outcome for the world, right? But this is, you know, so whether you're trying to build the, the largest language models and deploy them to improve accessibility, or whether you're trying to predict extreme weather to save lives and, and mitigate the impact of climate change, uh, these technologies are important. These technologies have implications, and, and these technologies are available, uh, and they're not easy. Again, mind you, the, the, you don't just implement them. You, you know, it's a journey with all of them, but there are benefits to that journey, and that's why uh, you know, I'm enthusiastic about it. Okay, I'm going to come to the final slide here. Next one. Just to wrap it up. So here we are. You know, th this is the final slide. I just want to give you kind of a summary slide uh, of everything we talked about because that was a lot of information, right? You've got these national AI programs. Everyone has them, including Estonia. There's policy, there's infrastructure, there's ecosystems. They're all important. Oh, you need all these components, no one part of it. Uh, historically, countries have focused a bit more on policy and ecosystems and kind of ignored the infrastructure part. Uh, and that's something that, you know, we're, we're going to change, not just we, NVIDIA, but, you know, OECD and so forth. Because you can't really have all those wonderful things I talked about, all those visions and dreams and benefits. You can't have them without the infrastructure. So you need all the pieces, right? But these are critical enablers of that value we talked about, right? Cap capturing the trillions in wealth. They're an enabler of the independence, the ability of a nation, large or small, to be more dependent on itself uh, a clock, you know, and not, not as dependent on foreign sources of infrastructure and talent. Uh, it's obviously an enabler of innovation, both industrial and scientific. It's an innovation, a key enabler of economic growth, and ultimately a key enabler of economic resilience, right? The ability to do these things independently in a sovereign way uh, and not have to, you always want to leverage the broader ecosystem, particularly in AI, but you also want to be able to do these things at home. So, so anyway, so that is the, let me wrap it up there. That was 48 minutes. So uh, I'm going to pause. Uh, thank you all for listening to me from Southern California. And I, I, I'm available for questions if that's something you want to do. Thank you very much, Steve. We do have uh, quite a many questions. And uh, okay. we'll see how many uh, are we able to fit. But there is, uh, there is a one question from Otto Matas, uh, which is, uh, could you expand on some of the key aspects or pre prerequisites of, for a nation to become a truly an AI nation. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I look. I, I I feel like I've kind of answered the question already, but but I, I'll read it, reiterate some points. I don't think everyone needs to have the same thing. You, everyone doesn't need to have the, the same level of talent or the same level or the same focus of their AI strategy. An AI nation is not a is not a cookie cutter. That, that is, if you don't do these three, you know, these ten things, you're not an AI nation. I think an AI nation is is a nation that takes 
this paradigm I just laid out in the last slide very seriously, right? There's AI policy, there's ecosystems, and there's infrastructure. You, you, need to, you need to focus and you need to be sophisticated in all three areas to be an AI nation. I think you can be very successful uh, without having, about being the leader in all three areas. You don't need to have the most talent, the biggest computer, nor do you have to be the leader in AI policy policy to be a good AI nation. But I think that definition should also be looked at as a domestic, almost more inwardly than outwardly. So, and what I mean by that is I'm not sure it matters so much to benchmark or compare yourself to other nations. Usually when we talk about AI or the, when the media, big media talks about AI, they immediately go to the US and China and they, you know, they talk, talk about it as a two, two horse race. And I, I think that's completely wrong. I think countries need to be AI nations for themselves, for their own benefit, to bring value to their citizens and to create innovation and growth and resilience and, and, and safety and all the things that come with that within their nation. Uh, that's more important than how you might compare to your neighbor or other nations. And so I think uh, there isn't one single definition or one single picture of an AI nation, but I think having, having sophistication and leadership and focus in those areas will lead to those goals. Yes, thank you. There is another question from uh, Silver Vapar, who asked, how have global market trends like uh, blockchain or chip shortage in recent years affected NVIDIA's perspective in terms of focus of, on AI and scientific computing? Yeah, sure. Well, to be fair, blockchain hasn't, I don't think blockchain has impacted our focus much. I, I'm personally a big fan of blockchain. I, I believe in it. Uh, I, I, I believe blockchain is 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 is, is, is having a tremendous uh, impact on decentralized finance and, and other areas of the economy, and we're at the early stages of seeing a tremendous wave of innovation there. It hasn't played a role for NVIDIA. Uh, it hasn't really been part of our landscape so much. Uh, maybe in the future, but not up to now. The chip shortage, or more 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 appropriately, the disruption to the global supply chain as it relates to the manufacturing of semiconductors, of course, has been disruptive to us as it has to the whole industry and to all of our, our peers in the industry. Uh, I mean, it, and it's not so much the manufacturer of our chips as much as it is the end-to-end -end electronic supply chain. And it's all the little parts that come together. We, we, have, we really haven't had a shortage of our chips as we have had a shortage of other people's chips and components. And, you, you know, you can build a car, but if you don't have tires, you can't move the car out of the garage. And so we can build our servers, but if we don't have all the parts we need, we can't ship them. And so uh, it, it has been disruptive. It continues to be disruptive. I think it's getting better but uh, I think it has shown the world just how dependent we are on each other. Yes, thank you. Mark Maggi has a question uh, for you, and he is asking what or how big is the role of the NLP or natural language processing in these AI strategies, policies in general? Yeah, I well, look, the first generation of, I think the first large-scale generation of AI success was in computer vision, for sure, right? You know, going back to, 2012 and AlexNet and all, all, all the sort of early breakthroughs uh, on AI. I mean, that, that's really deep learning really grew up and then became, you know, hit the map on the back of computer vision. But but the next wave of innovation has been natural language processing and the ability to not just speech to text, but to engage having conversations in a natural language way. And I think when when people who are not data scientists or not AI engineers, when they when they when they try to imagine what artificial general intelligence looks like uh, or feels like, they you know you you really go towards having a conversation with a machine, right? You go back to 2001 and HAL in the Space Odyssey, and you and you know it's about talking to a machine. So I think the ability to engage in a natural language way, in a speech way, whether it's speech or text, uh, that is the the cornerstone of what I believe we all perceive as artificial general intelligence. The progress on that front has been remarkable. You know, GPT-3 has been out for a few years. GPT-4 is about to come out. Uh, and I've already spoken to the team behind that. And what they've said to me is, you know, the, the models at this scale are starting to exhibit characteristics that are not mathematically explainable. Uh, you know, and that that they can do, the models are now able to engage in conversation, not just, again, not just to understand you, but to deduce what you're saying to almost demonstrate signs of intuition and a level of understanding of knowledge that 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 start you know puts us one step closer to what we all perceive as AGI. So I believe NLP is very very important to the to the advancement of the field. And I also think it's I also think it's one of the most important examples of how AI can can generate good for the world, like the preservation of language, like accessibility to services, and so forth. 
if if you allow me, I have a couple of more questions uh, that uh, uh, audience would like to ask you. And um, there is a Sven Lauders question who is asking, how seriously NVIDIA takes privacy of data processing? And when can we run standard GPUs inside a secure enclave so that I can hide my data from the service provider? Yeah, so first off, of course, NVIDIA takes privacy very seriously. And, and some of the some of the most cutting edge work done in uh, privacy enhancing technologies uh, is coming out of our collaboration with the Finnish government, actually, uh, in our joint lab uh, in Helsinki, uh, which is some work that we're quite proud of uh, for the past year. So uh, we're obviously, you, you know, like everyone else, you know, right, right on this, we're fully aligned and, and supportive of the regulatory uh, environment. As a company, we don't have, uh, we have a rather small consumer business uh, in, in a sense, right? We, while we do sell a lot of consumer GPUs from games, uh, our interface with the consumer space is very different. You know, we're, we're not, we're not, we don't have a large scale consumer business where we engage and collect consumer data like a Google or a Meta. So, you know, we don't do that. You know, most of our, our work is, is, is deeper in the stack. You know, we provide the platform on which consumer applications are built, but we're not involved in that, in that application level and we don't we, the data never comes to nvidia so so we really have a, a very limited uh, exposure frankly to privacy issues because of that we, you know we're we're not really a direct to consumer company in, in most in most respects uh, but but nonetheless as it relates to to uh, the second question and i'm not a deep expert in in cyber and so i, I don't want to go too far outside my lines but i will say this uh, i have seen over the past year the the enormous uh, growth in our focus on that question and and the integration of cyber and security deep into the stack, uh, frankly, and 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 that's and that's both driven by our own innovation desire to innovate as well as from our customers in the marketplace. And so I expect that the the use of GP well GPUs are now being used uh, at the network level, uh, not just at the computing level, but the network level for the protection of cyber networks and defense. Uh, and, and that there'll be you know this there'll be a rapid growth in that field. And I you should keep your eyes out for that. Yes, thanks. Um, and there is another question uh, from uh, Mart Norma. And the question is, in your opinion, do native speakers or of uh, small or large language see the value provided by the NVIDIA enabled language tech solutions differently? Yeah, yeah. well, you know, I, I saw this the other day. So I, I read that, that there are 7,000 languages in the world, right? The vast majority of, of, of big tech sort of interfaces come out and and you know you know able to speak four or five right you know out of the seven thousand and and in some countries like india there are more than 20 dialects and, and things of that nature and and in some countries you have a language with you know less than ten thousand people speak it and so you know you you have this incredible quilt of languages and i i, I don't think it's possible to preserve those languages without ai i think ai will be fundamentally the most important technology that, that you know, to that idea, and to that point, we're Nvidia is already doing that, working with the Mozilla Foundation and their Common Voice Initiative to capture as many languages as possible to create samples and databases of language uh, that can then be used to train models uh, to preserve them in the future. I don't think anyone is doing more than we are in that respect uh, right now, uh, and so I, I, I'm very proud of that. And I know other companies are working on on similar efforts, but I I, I do believe that 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 the the the, the, the ability without AI, the vast majority of those 7,000 languages will be forgotten. Let me just be that, that way. I think AI is the only chance for the preservation of language in the future. Thank you. And I have a last question uh, for you for, from the audience. Uh, it's from uh, Denis Nurk, and it's a more maybe a philosophical question, but still, are there any superhuman powers or capabilities of AI we should be afraid of? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course, someone has to ask that question. I don't know. You know, you're speaking to a relative optimist, right? So it's, it's. I mean, is there anything you should be afraid of? I don't think AI is scary. I, I think that, I think what we have to, what I would say is that it's not, AI is a dual use technology, right? It has tremendous good and it can cause harm if, if applied the wrong way, right? If there are malicious use cases. So it is important that we put boundaries and rules and guidelines and, and accountability and, and all those things, you know, around, around AI as we would any other technology with that potential, but but it's also morally neutral, right? The only thing you should be concerned about, which is true about any technology, are the people that use it, you know, the human behavior. That's that's where the risk comes in. 
in that, you know, AI uh, can be designed ethically and it can be engineered with tremendous safety guidelines. But if it is applied maliciously and it's used wrong, you know, with 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 negative intent, that's the biggest thing to worry about. And it's the same thing with any other technology in the world, including nuclear technology. So I, I think that it is not unique in that way. And I don't think I don't think there's a use case that's scary. I, my, my days are filled with seeing incredible use cases and how we're saving lives and using it in medicine and in climate and and in manufacturing and in, and in auto sector. In in fact, you know, one of the really cool use cases right there in Europe you know, is, again, the role of AI and auto. Everyone focuses immediately on self-driving cars, and, and that's fine. But actually, what's going to happen long before we have self-driving cars is that artificial intelligence will eliminate the possibility of dying in a car. Right. This idea of zero deaths from car accidents, that will only be possible through AI. And so before we have self-driving cars we'll have cars that are incre that are so safe they'll prevent accidents right they'll be the, they'll provide like this little angel sitting on your on your on your shoulder that make it very difficult to have an accident they'll pre or prevent someone else from hitting you and so i think that that I, again, I see all this incredible goodness coming out of it. What worries me are people and nations and, and 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 the malicious use of AI. And I think that's the right place for governments and legislators and policymakers to enact rules and boundaries to protect us all. Uh, but I, I don't fear AI. That's just, you know, I, I don't have any concerns.